Hey everybody, so I figured I would just kind of give a quick little spoiler breakdown of episode 6 and 8. Is it 8 or 9 of Marvel's What If? Yeah, let's get into it. So for off the bat, uh, I mentioned in my spoiler free review that like, yes, this is the first in a major property that is dubbed in like, you know, I would say in an American indigenous language. And we have, you know, it was performed in the original language. I know a lot of people brought up Prey. I know that I, I talked about it extensively before. There is a dub of Comanche. Luckily, it was done with the original actors of Prey, Amber Mid Thunder and Dakota Beavers. Like they actually went ahead and re-performed their, you know, Comanche dub. A lot of people want to point out Apocalypto, which was originally, uh, it was all performed in Mayan. I would say, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. But when it comes to like a larger property, like franchise thing, like this is probably the first, but this whole thing is centered around one new character, a protagonist in their world and is a hundred percent all in Mohawk. And I think that's just like, it's a big thing. You know, it's a big thing to have the entirety of the world view of the character all of it just done in mohawk and i thought that was absolutely great i, I might have, i might have said this a little weird at the way i edited it it's not weird that devry jacobs is a cohorty no i was it was just weird to me that in the marketing of this what if they weren't revealing that devry jacobs was the voice so I don't know, that that was what was weird to me. But again, Devery Jacobs did an amazing job. I think I mentioned Coendio plays, I think her younger brother or sister. And the other notable actor is uh, actually Jeremy White, uh, who plays, I can't pronounce his name, is, uh, what is it, Antarax? Antarax, who is kind of the guy that first introduces her to the Sky People world. Unka. <laughs> His character was really fun. I really enjoyed his character. He was he was a good proxy for the rest of the ancestor people that were in the you know the, the sky world and everything. But yeah, I loved his performance. He was really good. The, the thing is with like with the language and everything, I it was really nice just to see how casual the language felt. It wasn't like super theatrical. We got to see and feel pretty much how you know, the, this language, this indigenous language is spoken in a, in a pretty casual sense. And I really enjoyed that. The other thing I wanted to focus on that I thought was, I mean, story-wise, you know, we have like 30 minutes. <laughs> so of course I've, I've seen a lot of complaints about, you know, Kahori being super overpowered really quickly, a bit of a Mary Sue, right? But like, that's kind of the nature of when you're introducing an original character in a TV series that runs, you know, 30 to 40 minute episodes. So you kind of have to, but I, I, like I mentioned before, her, Devery Jacobs's performance and the actions of Kahori kind of make up for that. Like, yeah, she, the, the, the OP-ness, like she, she is able to kind of bring the portal to her and manifest it to her when before she couldn't do it like like where did that come from right but it came with a lot of trial and error with her trying to climb her learning her abilities and everything and i've seen it speculated a few people talking online that partially the reason why kahori is become so as powerful as she is is because she was injured when she landed i don't think a lot of other of the ancestors that that fell in or you know were injured Maybe they were, I don't know. But it's it's interesting to think about how like with the, the stones, I think sometimes are, you know, they're a bit sentient in a sense, you know, like the Mind Stone chose Wanda to be, you know, the Scarlet Witch and everything. So I don't know, it's just like story-wise, it just worked, you know, with, with Kahori. And there's a bunch of interesting themes that I wanna talk about here in a bit in regards to both history, culture and like how the story was utilized but i want to give props to ryan little he was the uh, the writer and director of this episode and he did an enormously good job and another thing to note is that there was heavy consultation with the mohawk nation and it was interesting how they came like came into working on it together i was reading that they uh, like you know this idea was pitched and they were like, okay, let's go to the Smithsonian. There's a Rolodex there of different contacts for each uh, rec 
uh, well, I don't know if it's federally recognized or any recognized tribe in the United States. And so that's how they were able to get involved with the Mohawk Nation in particular, with language and histor histor historiosity. And so that was an interesting thing. It was, they kind of went through like official channels. I thought that was significant because a lot of times I, it, it goes to show industry wise, because I'm speaking from experience when you have the, I guess the repertoire, the rapport of a major studio of a lot of money, a like an unrecognizable name, a lot of tribal nations will perk up a little bit to be like, okay, let's really evaluate this. The Osage nation definitely had that when Scorsese wanted to do Killers of the Flower Moon. Navajo Nation can kind of get like that a little bit. Um, I know there was some consultation with John Wu uh, and his production. They had to like, you know, they're like, yeah, sure. Yeah, good. <laughs> you know, but with smaller productions, short films and uh, independent features, those usually go through unofficial channels most of the time, which is I thought was interesting. There was a student film at my university that featured Shoshone people, but like nobody was Shoshone, like the actors. They had to hire some Latino actors. And I talked to the director, the student director, and he's like, well, we reached out to the, the tribe multiple times and no one answered, right? But it's just because, you know, it, it all goes down to production and how you approach it. But I don't know, that was just one little tiny example that really caught my mind about like major projects like this that have like a huge budget. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's Marvel, Disney, like they want to do a, you know, something with the Mohawk Nation. Um, I The Mohawk Nation for sure perked up and was like, oh, okay, if they're going to do it, then we got to be in charge to help make it right. And for the most part, I think it was great. Uh, they screened it with a indigenous, mostly indigenous, I want to say Mohawk, but it just said online as far as I read, you know, an indigenous audience. And it just got a pretty overwhelming, you know, positive feedback, right? And so, I don't know, just uh, the, the stuff around the production I thought was interesting. It's like, I don't want to say that there was no drama. There probably was a little bit, but like, like, <laughs> It's just it was just straightforward and it seems like every, everything cooperation on both sides was decent it was apparently a lot of support behind it and i think it's because this is low stakes for marvel it's an animated tv series that gets 30 minutes per episode so and the characters aren't really canon they're kind of like again it's a what if series because they go all over the place so it's just like there's a less of a risk in my opinion i'm speaking purely from like a production money standpoint it's not that like i don't believe in that this is a big deal it is but from like a studio standpoint it's like yeah, there's, there's low risk compared to making a full-blown movie about this character which leads me to the the, the length and everything it's just like i've seen a lot I, I was very curious to see what other people thought so i've been watching different people react to this episode and that was like pretty consistent critique is that this could have been a movie. This could have been an hour and a half full-blown, you know, feature film. And that would be cool. <laughs> it would be uh, a far cry from Pocahontas, you know, where we have a completely new character who is fresh, who is not tainted by all the just whitewashing of the history of, of Pocahontas and everything. And so, I don't know, I would love to see something like that. I highly doubt that they would, but I would love to see more of Kahori in kind of her own thing, you know? So the other notable things I wanted to talk about is the score. I talked about the score a little bit before in my spoiler free review. And more specifically, I wanted to talk about the use of Haudenosaunee music. And one notable track that I like, I, I, as soon as I heard it, I was like, I know that voice. I heard that song before and I was right. It was Joanne Shenandoah. And Joanne Shenandoah, uh, she is Haudenosaunee. A uh, pretty prominent uh, writer, singer, and the main theme that we hear that's kind of like Kahori's theme, it actually comes from a song called Prophecy. <sighs> For the sake of, I would say, reverence to the whole Peacekeeper story, there is like prophecies involved with that. But I thought that was really interesting how they use that song in particular for Kahori's kind of theme. All the time I am requested by people to translate lyrics. And my answer to that is 
These songs are not meant to be literal. They are meant to transport you or to take you to a sacred place. And therefore, the meaning is very simple in many cases. There are over 200 songs in honor of women, for example. And uh, there are songs just for healing. There are songs that actually will quicken your death. I love the climax of the episode where she's facing off with the conquistadors. I'll get to them in a bit. And we see the, the her ancestors, the sky people, coming in to save save everyone else. And the whole thing is a bit, I want to say melancholic, but it's definitely, some people would say it's contrapuntal. Contrapuntal means like when the music and the visuals are contradicting, but it's not. And for an indigenous viewer, it was it was just cathartic. That whole sequence, it was just, it was poetic, it was cathartic, it was, it was just special. I, I really enjoyed it. And the fact that they use Ahoda Nishone's voice and song really kind of hit it home, you know. <sighs> And the other thing that I thought was interesting is they bring, they talk about a bit, they, they hint towards uh, the Peacekeeper story about how Jeffrey Wright, you know, as the Watcher comes in and explains how they warred with each other, but they had an era of peace. And that's talking about, you know, the formation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Greed and grief ignited a terrible battle amongst the surrounding nations. In the end, peace was made. We see more of that if you know anything about wampum belts. Wampum belts are these belts that are made out of uh, certain types of shells. And the wampum belt is uh, a symbol of peace. And it is, as far as I understand, if you're Mohawk, if you're Haudenosaunee, you can correct me in the comments. But as far as I understand it, that the, the wampum belt, it's like basically the the tenets of the peace the peacekeepers plans are kind of embedded in that and wampum belts are used as kind of peace offerings and we see that they literally make an effort to do a close-up shot of kohori or someone else either kohori or someone else i forgot uh holding the wampum belt when they when they talk to queen isabella at the end and so it's a peace offering she's like we can have an alliance pretty much how their ancestors did now this leads me into the themes of peace and war mixed in with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the peace plan and this episode, which I thought was fascinating because if you know anything about the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, is that these these tribes, there were four originally, I think five, a fifth one came later. They all formed a confederacy. They all kind of created this longhouse of, you know, protecting borders. And the idea was that these five tribes came together for peace to be you know it was the the whole story of the peacekeeper and hiawatha and uh tadadaho that's a really cool story there's different versions of it i know there's probably one version that's a lot more consistent but is held in more high regard and is only told in certain circles as far as i know i've heard from different haudenosaunee people about like the idea behind a peace plan and one is that like it would protect them from larger forces it would protect them from other tribes maybe from down south or up north the idea was that like the Haudenosaunee like family would be united together to to kind of protect themselves so like one they would stop killing each other but in general that if anything came they would need to protect themselves it's interesting that Kahori kind of revitalizes this, this this idea among the sky people she she says that you know you were you're you're disconnected and you need to go back and remember who you are. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't know. It just it was it was really fascinating to kind of see how these these ideas of war and peace kind of were explored with Kahori and how she and I think that's partially why she was kind of OP, but it was because she was the one who was acting, who she was the one who saw that there was an injustice going on. There was just some, you know, just bad things going on. I have the power to stop it and I'm going to do something about it. 
And that's probably why the power and the land chose her, you know. And so she was resilient. She had a resolve. And she was going to do her best to try and, you know, fix it. <laughs> it's just interesting. Like, even after all the war, uh, the fighting against the conquistador, she still wants to try and establish some peace with the Spanish Empire, which I thought was, you know, like, it was just, you know, she 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 still stood her ground. She still was like, basically, like, we can we can change things here. You know, you better listen. Firmaremos la paz. O no habrá futuro para vuestro pueblo. But they still wanted to offer peace. You know, it was it was really interesting, and that's kind of like the title of the episode is you know what if Kahori what, what is it what if Kahori uh, reshaped the world, and something like this would definitely reshape the world. <laughs> and so it'd be interesting to see in a what if scenario the Mohawk Nation being you know like this in comparison to uh, Wakanda, and seeing how maybe they would maybe maybe interact or something it'd be really interesting to see that the, all those little elements of kind of the themes there i thought were fascinating and oh and there was one there were a few moments that really kind of like uh, i guess spoke to me in a more emotional level i mentioned that in my spoiler free review but one it was very a nonchalant conversation when she's climbing up the tree and recognizing that she can do these abilities Atarax, I can't say his name properly, but Atarax, he asked her, he, he, it's a very specific framing of wording. He says, <laughs> And if you know anything about the Haudenosaunee clan system and some of their lore and, and how the worldview is, that, that line was just really fascinating. I just thought it was cool. <laughs> it was just, it was, it was such an interesting little tidbit of like how you know, the Mohawk people in the Haudenosaunee, you know, functioned how they saw each other. It's just pretty much how, like, in my culture, you know, I ask someone, yeah, like, who who are you? Usually they would, like, say my name, and uh, they would also tell me their clans. And from the clan system, I'm able to recognize if we're related or maybe place who they are, where, where they're from, and stuff like that. Helps develop a sense of kinship with that person. But that 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 little conversation, I just thought was I don't know. There was just something about that conversation that really kind of just emotionally touched me a bit. I was like, oh man, that's just so cool that they added that in there. And the second one was the ending when Kahori is uh, talking to uh, Wata, and she's talking about her ancestor. <laughs> that whole sequence when they're she, she's looking around and seeing her ancestors just kick ass <laughs> it still had it still echoed some of the feelings i had with the um ancestors episode the prayer episode in reservation dogs i had that same feeling and i felt like th that moment in the show i think it was really meant for indigenous audiences i think that was more for them for us but I mean, the show managed to just pack everything in there. Again, you can only do so much when you're introducing a fresh new character in like 30 minutes to try to get us to kind of, I, I can see something being done that's similar to Prey, where we have uh, something very similar to Kahori's story mixed in with like the pacing of Prey and you'll get something really cool. We'll get something really cool, but I don't know. I highly doubt that they would flesh her out, but I hope they would. The other thing that I wanted to talk about too was the art style. It was really interesting to see how they incorporated a lot of Haudenosaunee art into this without making it cheesy. They they grounded the the art style and, and everything with uh, in mixture with the MCU, right? It was really fascinating. Anyways, the what if thing too. I wanted to talk about the, his, the history stuff. It's interesting that this what if is also asking what if in it's definitely a different timeline in, on Earth because it's like, the, as far as we know, the conquistadors never went as far as New York. They all were in, you know, the, the furthest they went north as far as I know in North America was like up until, you know, Colorado, up into, the Cal, into California. Santa Fe was like the largest hub down in that area. It, it's interesting to see how they use conquistadors to kind of showcase the, you know, the bad guys. I thought that was really interesting. And apparently there's some like 
the there's some Spaniards who modern day Spaniards who took offense to this the Spanish representation uh, in this. It did feel a little you know mustache twirly, but at the same time, it's like <laughs> the Spanish in this world are so just arrogant <laughs> and persistent and it's annoying and it's just like yeah but i mean in real life that's pretty much how a lot of them were they were arrogant ¿Os vais amenazarme a mí? en mi propia corte me fue encomendada la tarea de gobernaros a vuestra gente i i just wanted to talk about that and how like some people are kind of pissed off about the representation of spain or like how you know like oh why the hell are the spanish they were never up there but right it's a freaking marvel show and this is what i was saying in my my non-spoiler reviews like just give us this you know like with prey too just give us this man like history turned out the way it did why can't we have fun in fiction and if you're mad about the narrative in fiction then i think that says a lot about what about you know how protective you are of your worldview and where your values are and it's really fascinating to see how they brought Kahori in to uh, play a big part in the finale with helping Captain Carter uh, fight off against the evil Doctor Strange. Like that whole thing was really cool. And I guess like it was really cool to see her utilize all the different like <laughs> both her and Captain Carter. Like it was cool to see her use the 10 rings and stuff like that. But it was just cool. It was, it was kind of cool to see her adapt and learn as she went along. And everything i just want to know how she's able to learn languages so so freaking fast but maybe the powers allow her to do that <laughs> she learned spanish and she learned english pretty quickly so um but that's just maybe that's just it comes with the abilities of you know having the tesseract space stuff inside you right that's it that that was pretty much the main points i wanted to talk about with this whole thing with kahori it's cool and it's really nice to see a lot of people, non-native people, were responding to this character in this in this episode and saying that it's refreshing. They're saying that like, oh man, this is actually really nice. And they aren't turned off much by the subtitles. And I guess that 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 for me is like, yes, like audiences are becoming a lot more aware of other languages. Uh, uh, American audiences, Western audiences are becoming a little bit more tolerant of subtitles. I think, I honestly think anime plays a huge role in that. But I mean, like Godzilla minus one, I've seen it twice now, is all subtitled and it is still selling tickets like crazy in North America, you know? So audiences are maturing with international sensibilities, you know? And of course, like, you know, this is the fact that this whole episode, like there's English is only spoken by the characters and everything until like the last five seconds. The rest is all, in Mohawk and in Spanish, right? It's just, it was awesome. It was nice, it was refreshing. A lot of people notice that when I'm watching different reactors as they watch the show, they're like, oh, this is way different. This feels way different. I just wanna give props to, to Ryan Little. I uh, I misspoke, Ryan Little wrote the episode, but Brian Andrews uh, directed this. So I just wish we had more native, like a more native centric uh, writing room and director. But like the fact that like this is, in my opinion, the language and the story, the, the acting all kind of, I don't wanna say balances it out, but this is definitely within the realms of a native themed projects, but it is still, it's in my top like five right now. It's so good. I just, I wish we could get more. I even found this at, um, I found this at Target on clearance. It was kind of sad, but there's a figure inside. I still need to open it, but it's of Kohori. Anyways, uh, I have some exciting stuff for you about Echo <laughs> coming up. So yeah, uh, be on the lookout for that. I figured I'd just kind of spill my thoughts out to you guys about about Kahori here and um this is this is this is the beginning like we're at an all-time high right now last year and this year have been a, have been really good years for native and indigenous representation in popular media and so we're getting we're getting more and i hope this can kind of give more of a i guess like a push to mainstream studios and other places to kind of see how well this is working i mentioned before how 
there could be a really great future with native characters and native worlds and animation. I've always thought this idea would go be too crazy, but the more I thought about it, I was like, well, they made Yasuke. Yasuke was like fantastical and stuff. Uh, you should check out Yasuke, it's interesting. But we're having a, a lot of cool original animated stories coming out from a lot of anime studios and also just other studios in general. But like, I mean, like a native fantasy based storyline you know would just be really cool uh something like this like the animation really kind of made me see like there's a lot of potential here for uh, native stories in animation there could be some really cool fantastical stuff that we could play around with and uh, a lot of themes that we could play with and stuff like that so that kind of made me think more about the future so that's it everybody i'll see you guys in the next one